Hey, I just want to tell everyone thank you for spending a couple hours with us. Specifically, I'd like to thank the folks of the American Wood Council, Buddy Showalter, Marcy, and Michelle for inviting me to talk today. And I'd like to, they've been great cooperators for the Forest Service and the Forest Products Lab for many years. And also, thanks to all you folks. I noticed there's about 340 people on, on the line today. Thank you for taking the time from your day to hopefully get some good information on condition assessment of in-service wood. Uh, before I go into too much of the detail, I'd like to give you just a little background about where I work and who I work for. I'm a federal employee. I work for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, the U.S. Forest Service, and specifically stationed at the Forest Products Laboratory here in Madison. Um, we're a national lab. We've been in existence since 1910. Um, everything we do is available on our website. Um, you'll see some documents today that you can get either from the American Wood Council or off the Forest Products Laboratory's website. Just a little background on the Forest Service. The Forest Service is the largest employer and the largest agency in the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We've got somewhere between 30 and 40,000 employees um, that goes up and down depending on the time of the year. Uh, I'm sure most of you folks have seen a lot of our work when you visit the, any one of the national forests or gra grasslands in the U.S. We're responsible for the management of those lands. As part of the Forest Service's mission, we focus on using good science to manage those forests. And as a consequence, we have the largest natural resource-based research organization in the world. The Forest Service funds a research organization that has scientists stationed from Maine to Hawaii and Alaska to Puerto Rico. And a lot of those folks deal with regional issues. And they're organized in what we call stations. The Forest Products Laboratory is located in Madison, Wisconsin. It is part of that organization within the Forest Service. And um, as a consequence, of the, it, it, we're a national laboratory. We, we have a national significance or impact. We work virtually across the board with all kinds of different cooperators, university folks, other government agencies and um, private sector corporations. So we're a national lab. Uh, simple contact for us. Just go to Google or any of those search engines, type in Forest Products Laboratory, will come up. We've been in existence, as I said, for over 100 years. All of our publications are in the public domain. They're available to you at no cost. You can search on anything you want from how to identify wood to the properties of wood fiber to how to inspect old iron sides. Um, get on there, use it. Uh, we're also here to answer questions. And we do a lot of that in conjunction with the American Wood Council and folks like that. But um, give us a call. All the information for myself and the scientists here are available on the website. There's contact information for both for snail mail, um, our email addresses, and our uh, phone numbers as well as fax numbers. So we're here really to, to service you folks, to help you out. Give us a ring. So that's a little bit of background on it. Uh, everybody always asks why we chose Madison. At the time the lab was formed in 1910, that was the center of the wood industry. And actually, it's worked out very good for us to be here. So anyway, that's a little bit about the Forest Products Laboratory. As Marcy said about myself, I've been at the laboratory but just a little over 27 years now. I've enjoyed every minute. I've had the opportunity to work with folks like Buddy and, and a lot of the folks at the American Wood Council as well as a lot of our colleagues in industry and university people to develop the kind of information that allows us to use wood in a very, very responsibly responsible way, um, uh, especially on the engineering side. So. That's a little about me and about the Forest Products Lab. And so feel free at any time to ask any questions or check out our website. Let's move on here. Um, Marcy, I don't believe I have to cover these copyright materials. Um, what I want to get to is the course description. What we're going to do today is just focus on the presence, 
the present state of the art in assessment methods for wood and timber structures. I'm going to go through those individually. And what I'm going to do also at, after those, we'll take and ask some questions after those. And then what I'm going to do is put up some very, inter what I consider interesting projects that we've been involved with over the years that will uh, show those various technologies being used and uh, present results from them. And we've got things in there from some large glued laminated structures up to inspection of old iron sides or USS Constitution. Um, so anyway, that's the course description and what our objectives will be today are, first of all, to provide you some background information on the unique characteristics of wood as a structural material. It's very unique and has a lot of different properties compared to, say, other structural materials like steel, concrete, masonry, even some of our advanced composites. So I, I just want to spend a little time with you folks going over those, and I, I think it'll become self-evident as to why we do what we do. Then I'd like to hopefully come out of this with some baseline information on assessment methods for in-place assessment of structures, including state-of-the-art non-destructive evaluation methods and equipment that's available. We're going to present some example evaluations. And then what I want to do, and really what you should come out of this with, more important than any of my discussion, is really two good state-of-the-art sources for information on assessment of in-service wood. I think they're, they're excellent resources. We've tried to put those together uh, to answer a lot of the questions we would get from folks like you in the field who are, who are actually at the forefront of dealing with these things. We're going to show these at the end, too, with websites. But there's two documents that I use a lot, and I recommend people get a hold of anybody who's doing any kind of in-service condition assessment or inspection. The one on our left is we're very proud of. It's called the Wood Handbook. That basically is a compilation of the properties and characteristics of wood, wood products, lumber products, clear wood properties, everything from the anatomy of wood up through uh, how you design timber bridges or fasteners with wood. It's about 600 pages long. It's available on our website. It's one of our most highly used documents. We get somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 to 200,000 downloads a year of that. So it's a very well-referenced document. Um, Particular chapters that are going to be important to you folks would be Chapter 5 on Clearwood Properties. We get a lot of calls from practicing engineers, and we designed that chapter to help us answer those questions. So there's table in there, table in Chapter 5, that has, in essence, all the mechanical properties from just about any kind of wood you can think of, both, dom both domestic in the U.S., Canadian, and um, uh, uh, as well as some tropical woods. So that's, that's, that's a very important thing. There's, in addition to that, there's an entire chapter dedicated towards demonstrating to people how we come up with allowable design values for wood products. Now, that particular chapter in Wood Handbook talks about new wood, but, but it's an excellent basis, and it, and it shows you exactly what we go through when we come up with allowable design values and how those are derived. So it's an excellent resource. In addition to Chapter 5 and the work on Clearwood Properties, there's chapters in there that I'm sure are going to have major impact on what you folks see in the field. There's a chapter in there on biodeterioration of wood that describes in detail how various biological agents affect wood and in-service wood properties. It talks about things like decay, termite infestation, marine borers, excellent background information. There's another one in chapter in there that talks about the physical properties of wood. And one of those has a uh, section on natural durability of wood. So you'll get a table in there that tells you the relative ranking of various wood products or wood materials and their natural durability. The other chapter that's very highly used is a chapter on uh, preservative treatments. Anybody who's in, been in the field, we run into that problem a lot. Has it been treated? What's it been treated with? 
there's a chapter in there that deals just with preservative treatments and their use with wood. And it's current up to the date when we delivered this, uh, published this since about 2010. So it's, it's very state of the art as far as what's going on there. The other chapter that I think is very important that uh, we developed specially for this particular edition of the Wood Handbook is a chapter on wood composite materials in a variety of composites. And that covers everything from wood plastic composites that we see in decking materials. We've, I'm sure all you folks have seen that. Up through and including uh, glued laminated timbers, laminated veneer lumber products, and comparison of those properties from those materials to solid sawn materials. So those are major chapters you're probably going to want to look at. The other chapter that we get a lot of calls in and we put together to help out with is the chapter just on fasteners and the design and, and background information on wood fasteners in, or excuse me, fasteners in wood. And that includes discussion on uh, nails, screws, wood screws, uh, very solid background information that we use quite a bit. So it's a great document. It's available and will be made available through the American Wood Council. And it's also available on our website. You can pull it off in its, in, in its entirety or you, everything's in a PDF format, searchable. You can pull it off by chapter. So feel free to use it. We're real proud of it and, and hopefully it's of a benefit to you. The, the other one, and I think is very specific to this topic area, is a book we just published last year, and it's it's really uh, focused on this topic area. It's called our Wood and Timber Condition Assessment Manual. It's the second edition. Basically, everything you're going to see today, all the photos, all the graphics, are in that manual in more detail. Excuse me. Um, it's it's put together in cooperation with the American Wood Council. Uh, it's a really solid document that we've gotten very positive results on. It includes a chapter on visual inspection technologies and techniques, what to look for, what are some of the obvious things we see. A lot of photos from actual inspections I or my colleagues have been involved with over the years. I'll share some of those photos with you during this webinar. There's a chapter in there on um, development of allowable design values for in-service wood. So I think that'll be really important for you, well put together, and a, a very important document. That topic is, is, is pretty covered in real detail in there. We won't go into that detail today. Um, that would be probably an hour and a half or two hour seminar in itself. There's chapters on probing technologies. Um, a lot of people use those. I'll cover some of that today in this, this presentation. Uh, ultrasound technologies. There's actually uh, an example condition assessment report in that document, as well as summaries from some of the inspections and a listing of the publications that support those inspections in the report. So please use it. It's a, it's a great document. We're real proud of it, and I hope it's of benefit to you. One thing that's important in there, when we go through some of these things today, I'm going to talk about some of these technologies and techniques. I'm not going to today give you listings of equipment, where to get it, contact information. All of that is in the Wood and Timber Condition Assessment Manual. Websites, snail mail addresses, all the contract information you need to, to get that information and to, to help you with your assessment work. So. Please feel free to use those. They're available, and um, we're real proud of them, and hopefully they're a benefit to you. Our first polling question, uh, Marcy, do I read these or do you? Would you guys respond to this? Marcy? I'm sorry. I was muted. You're <laughs> muted. Do you want me to read these? I got it. Okay. I think. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay. And people are voting, so they know what to do, so that's good. What is your profession? A, architect. B, engineer. C, code official. D, building designer. Or E, other. All right. And we've got 80% have voted, so I'm going to go as soon as 30 seconds are up. All right. 30 seconds are up. I'm going to close the poll and share the poll. 
So 87% are engineers, excellent. 7% code officials, 3% architects, and just a couple um, are others. No building designers. And there we go. OK, let's go to our next question. All right. And let's see. Oh, I shared that again. Sorry. Not used to back-to-back -back ones. Have you done existing wood condition assessments? Yes or no? Oh, I think I just messed up. OK. I'm so sorry. I'm not going to be able to allow people to vote. Let me see if I can do this real quick. Oh, folks, I'm so sorry. Let me see if I can. While you're doing it, let me just, can I take it, Marcy, just a little bit here? Yes, please do while I put this hey, in again. Just to give you folks an idea, I've been teaching these kind of short courses for the American Society of Civil Engineers for about 20 years. And I always ask these two questions. And uh, if you were here, I'd ask you another question is, what are you seeing in the field? And based on what comments I got back from folks, it helped guide our research program and it helped us design these webinars and these short courses to try and hopefully answer their questions. So that's what would follow next if we were in person, but we're not. So um, anyway, it's great to see so many folks here that are engineers and architects. Uh, I'm assuming most of you folks have a pretty extensive background in, in some type of condition assessment, maybe not wood. But uh, that's why you're here today. So I'm going to go on that assumption, and we'll go from there. How's that sound, Marcy? That sounds good, although I have the question now ready if we want to do it. OK, go ahead and poll them and see what we got. OK, go for it. Vote. <laughs> and, and we're north of Chicago, so the rule here is vote early and often. <laughs> although I don't think this will let them vote more than once. So 84% have voted, so let me close and I'll share. 72% have done existing um, work with assessment and 28% have not. That's great. That's great. Well, then you folks that have, have done these, you're going to probably have some horror stories that are very similar to what I'm going to show. And uh, for the ones who haven't, um, it'll, it'll hopefully be in, in, enlightening for you. So. Well, let's move on a little bit. How's that sound? Let's just divert here just a second and think about wood as a structural material. And it's a little different than concrete and steel. And I just want to spend a little time going about giving you some baseline information about wood as an engineering material. And hopefully that helps you get a grasp of where we're at and why we do some of the things we do. Um, this part, this slide really came about from some consulting work I did years back where I was asked to do an inspection of a wooden t cooling tower down in Houston, Texas. And the consulting engineer on it had pulled me in, and he was literally pulling his hair out uh, because he had a lot of experience in steel and concrete and not in wood. So he really had just a lot of questions. And I spent a lot of time with him just going over the basics of wood and wood science and wood as a material. So we'll start with that. Um, first of all, wood is a biological material. And you know it's sustainable, but it comes from our forests. And that could be urban forests as well as forests out in the countryside. The basic constituents of wood in its raw form are cellulose, hemicellulosis and lignans. And there are some extractives in there. But the main load carrying components in it are cellulose chains. And if you look down at the far bottom of that, without getting into too much detail, that's what a chemical cellulose chain is. And that's built up into fibers and then those fi into layers within a fiber. And then those fibers are actually laid down in various growth rings. And that's, I'm sure, as you've all seen when you go to the lumber yard. Because of the way they're laid down and because of the way wood is, it's very anisotropic. It's very non-homogeneous. And in some cases, it's very non-linear in its behavior. And as a consequence of all that, 
its mechanical property variation is quite high relative to steel and concrete. To give you an idea, coefficient of variation for some of those materials is what, 7, 10%. For most wood, we assume that its strength properties, coefficient of variation is somewhere in the neighborhood of 15, 20%. And we have to do that because we have to cover the variability of it. That's within one species or one species grouping. If we look at the entire package, we have even a greater variability. Uh, for example, and I'm sure you've all seen this, uh, some of our oaks, wherever you are, oak trees, the wood is very dense, quite durable, and extremely strong. Conversely, if we go out and look at aspen trees, poplar they're commonly called, very low density, very um, not many extractives, so not very durable, and really quite low in strength. And so depending on what kind of species you got and depending on where you're at, you can get quite a bit of variability. And within a structure, you'll have a lot of people who, in some, especially these older structures, mixing and matching materials, and that can cause some real problems from a property standpoint as well as from a dimensional stability standpoint. So. Just one of the things we've got to deal with. It's a biological material, and it has relatively high variability. Some of the advantages of wood I want to cover. First of all, it has a very high strength rate weight ratio, um, especially parallel to the fiber axis. Wood in a material, wood as, a, as it's grown, is strongest parallel to the fiber axis. So for our standpoint, uh, from a practicing engineer standpoint, it's strongest along the grain or along the 2x4 or along the timber. It's weakest perpendicular to that. Some of the property ratios you'll get is almost a 15 or greater to 1 ratio between parallel to perpendicular properties, so very significant. That's why we have a lot of concern and debate over design of fasteners and how they perform because of that anisotropy, anisotropy of wood. Um, but it is an excellent material from a standpoint parallel to the fibers. Uh, it has a really good record for durability and performance, uh, especially if you look at the photo in the right-hand side. That's a very classic, iconic photo we use. The horizontal member with the nails in it is actually a large timber that survived the fire, and you can see that the steel melted in the fire. Wood does really quite well, especially heavy timber construction in, in high temperature environments. Uh, we get a char layer that forms. The char layer becomes a very good insulator, and that insulator protects the inside core of the wood or the timber member that's left from any kind of thermal degradation. So it works really, really well in heavy timber construction and fire. If you want, there is a whole chapter on post-fire assessment in the Wood and Timber Condition Assessment Manual, very well written by one of my colleagues, Robert White. So anyway, it has a very good record for durability and performance. Um, especially, there is, there is some durability, durability differences between species. But with some of the common preservatives we use today and good design practice, you can take care of a lot of the concerns we have with durability. It's very good insulation against heat and sound and electricity, absorbs energy quite well and dissipates it quite well. So it, it, there's a real advantage to that. It absorbs and dissipates vibration quite well, shock loads quite well. So it's a, it's a good material as far as that goes. It is not a brittle material. It behaves, in most cases, in a very ductile fashion. So as a consequence of that, it's very good at absorbing and dissipating energy in a variety of forms. The good part and the bad part of wood, and I'm going to show you an example of that, is very easy to modify and repair in the field. Uh, I'll show you an example of that, why I think um, it's a blessing and a curse. A major disadvantage with wood and that we constantly run into is it has issues in relationship to moisture. Um, because of its biological nature and the way it's formed, when wood water gets into wood, it causes it to swell and to move. And we've all been in buildings where we've seen you know tables that are a little not level anymore, doors that have warped. Up here in the Midwest, we have floors that buckle. 
A lot of that has to do with the absorption or desorption of water during the various times of the year because the wood actually moves. If you go to our wood handbook and look at one of our chapters, there's a whole chapter that developed, excuse me, devoted to wood moisture relationships, how it moves, how much it moves for various wood species. The other thing that you have to be concerned about with wood, and I just threw a photo up there, is as beautiful as those fruiting bodies are, they're really cool and nice and a lot of my artist friends love them. The fact of the matter is wood is a biological material and it's a source of energy and it's a source of food for various bio, bio mechanisms. For example, fungi love to eat the cellulose portion of wood. So when wood gets wet and we get water in there, it provides the necessary moisture in an oxygen-rich environment like we would have above ground, we start to see fungal growth. And I'm sure all you folks have seen that kind of thing. So one of the concerns with wood is, is its relationship with water. I always say that there's three rules with using and designing with wood. Keep it dry, don't let wood near water, and keep water and wood separate. So it's, it's a very important thing. Now, from an inspection standpoint, and I'll show you some photos of that, the first thing I look for is any place where there's water intrusion or water interactions with wood. For fungi and these biodeterioration mechanism uh, agents to work, they need three things. They need food and shelter, which is wood. They need oxygen, and they need uh, water. So any place where those three things kind of interact, you'll start to see potential for biodeterioration. Now why that's important? Biodeterioration can degrade the strength properties of wood extremely quickly and very severely. One of the common things we see is uh, what we call brown rot decay fungi. You've probably all seen this in the field. The wood looks crumbly and it's lost mass and density. Well before it gets to that point, that fungi's got in there and it's basically eating away the cellulose. And when it does that, it takes away the major load carrying components of the actual cell fiber. And as a consequence, we have done studies here in the lab that will show you, and they're available on our website, that prior to weight loss, you can have a 75% strength property loss if there's decay in there prior to any visual assessment or decay thing or uh, indicators. So when we see these types of things, we know there's a significant problem. So one of the number one things I want you to come away with is when you get to a structure, always, always look around. Where's that interaction between the oxygen, the wood, and, uh, and the water? Because that, that becomes a major issue. So, okay. So as I said before, the number one thing is keep it dry. Now, I'm going to divert here just a second. I don't have a photo of this, but to give you how, to give you how uh, an indication of how important that is, we just completed several years ago the inspection of a 2,500-year-old mummy coffin from Egypt that was solid wood. And 2,500 years, but it had been kept very dry and it had been kept away from moisture, and long story how it came to us, but basically a large museum here in the United States wanted to display it and ask for our assessment of it. I did the inspection, and I can report that that is the best looking piece of wood I've ever seen, but it was kept dry for 2,500 years. And uh, it's a real indication to me, and really drove home to me the importance of wood water interactions and what can happen if you keep wood dry and manage that and what can't happen if, if you don't. So anyway, we'll go on to the next one. Uh, let's start with a little bit of the assessment procedures that we, we use. Uh, when I go into a building or any kind of structure, whether it's a mummy coffin or a historic ship or any kind of building, the first thing I look for is I do an overall assessment. But a couple things we really look for, and if you call in, we need from you. What species is it? And I'll go into some of these in a little more detail. That's very important because the design values we use are very, uh, to a certain extent, are species dependent, but they're definitely species grouping dependent. So that's very important. We need to know that. 
Uh, we look for things like what's the quality of the wood, what's the property of the wood. And, and if you get in there, I'll show you some examples of this. Things we look for are grade stamps, if there's any on there, certain visual characteristics. And from that, we can get basic property information from you, or you can derive them yourself from the Wood and Timber Condition Assessment Manual. The other thing we always look for is the condition of it. That's where the condition assessment comes in. Is there any mechanical uh, the modifications to the building? I'll show you some examples of that. Any biological damage? Any fire damage? Any chemical damage? Has it been treated? Is it treated? If so, what's it treated with? Those kinds of things are all important. Um, when you want to come up with an assessment, overall assessment of a building. Species identification, um, usually that's done with a low magnification visual examination. And it's done, there are a variety of consultants. If you get on the website, on any of the websites, you can see consultants who do wood identifications. Many universities have wood science programs, either in their forestry schools or their material science departments and they'll do wood identifications for you. Uh, we can do a certain amount of those here at the laboratory. We have the largest wood collection at the laboratory. Um, but I always recommend that you, if you can, get the business out to the consultants and university folks. Uh, if you need help getting those information on those, give me a call. I'll be happy to, uh, to give you information on them. Uh, usually it requires just a very small sample from one of the members, not very big. Uh, no more than an inch square. Some of them will even do it if you just send them a sliver. Um, most of it's done with a small hand lens at low level magnification. And I would guess most of the wood you're going to see in the United States are, are excuse me, are, are native to the U.S. And most of the work we do, they, there's, a, there's a group of woods that have been used for structural applications for many years. And so it's a pretty narrow band. But, but they will provide you uh, with a documentation that says, I've inspected this piece of wood, and I, it is such and such a species. Where that's very important is, and I get a lot of calls on this, where that's very important is if there's any um, loss of life or any loss of limb uh, in any of these inspections, because that will have to be used in a court of law as evidence. So, what I recommend in those cases is people get one or two wood identifications, same species, just like you would get a second opinion in any kind of medical procedures you have. I recommend to get at least two or three of those. They should come back with the same recommendation and then go from there. But, but there's a few around. But if you need help, give me a ring. Um, you don't have to take out the whole piece. You do not have to tear out the whole piece. You don't have to take a skill saw and cut and, and go wild tearing things out, just a small piece of wood, and they'll give you a really good indication of what the species is. Quality property assessment. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into the details on this, but uh, basically we we'll use uh, visual grading rules to come up with the allowable design values. And what they want to look for specifically that on that web, excuse me, on your picture though, you'll see just kind of a generic uh, grade stamp. If you see something like that in one of those buildings and you see it on a 2x4 or 2x12, I always recommend take a photograph of it, get it back to us, because then at least we kind of know what we're dealing with. It gives us a good starting point. Um, we work very closely with the folks at the American Wood Council and other folks. And once we get that kind of information, we can help you out really quite well. So if you see those, the things that are go into one of those grade stamps that we're going to look at, on um, this particular one, it's, it says number one and better. That's the grade. Uh, that S-GRN, that means it was surfaced in a green condition. That tells us something about the wood. The very right-hand lower corner of that grade stamp gives us a species grouping. So that kind of gives us an indication of where we're at as far as the species goes. Um, the 12 up on the top there probably is the mill number, so we could trace it back. In some, that refers to the moisture content of the wood when it went in, so that when it was constructed. And that little logo on the bottom, that's the indicator of the particular grade, uh, uh, the uh, grading association, in this particular case, Western Wood Products Association. So if you get those, 
and you call me up, that's one of the first things I'm going to ask you. Do, do you see any grade stamps? Do you see anything there? If so, can you give me that information? That would be very beneficial. Because from that, it makes it a little easier to make some decisions as to what we're talking about as properties. Some of the visual characteristics you're going to want to look for, and this is really in detail in the Wooden Timber Condition Assessment Manual, visual characteristics. Are there knots there? You know, which knots are those big, darker areas that are very dense? Those are actually the limbs of the tree, and when they cut the two by four out of it or the lumber out of it, that comes through as a big knot. That's a big strength reduction uh, in the proper is strength reduction for that particular member. It's it can be cause a lot of problems depending on how it's oriented within the structure and how it's loaded. So we're going to ask you that. We're going to ask you things like, what's the slope of grain? And what we're trying to get at there is um, those trees don't necessarily all go, grow straight. And when they're cut, as a consequence of that and the way they're cut, the fibers do not always line up perfectly parallel to the long axis of the member. And as a consequence of that, we start to get into some problems with reductions in load carrying capacity. So that's what we refer to when we talk of slope of grain. Warp, that's how much it's moved or twist out of plane. Uh, that's very important because it's going to tell us stuff about how much moisture this thing has seen. Has there been any moisture events? Um, those types of things, very important. Are there checks or splits in it? And I'll show you some examples of that where that's very important. That's specifically important on how it's loaded and where it's loaded and where the check or split is relative to that loading. Uh, in addition to that, and I'll show you a photograph of something like this that highlights this, if it's a treated large timber, the presence or absence of splits are going to be really important to well, how well that preservative works in protecting the internal parts of the member. The other thing is any visual evidence of decay or deterioration. Do you see any big fruiting bodies? As I said, some of my friends want me to cut those out. They're art friends. I said, boy, that'd be great. And I said, yeah, you can have it. That's a very severe uh, deterioration, indication of very severe deterioration and major reduction in load carrying capacity. So those things are major things you should look for in your visual assessment. Um, any kind of external deterioration. Um, now, the, how we do these, um, these are some of the technologies we use to, and I'll go through some of these. We look for exterior, de, excuse me, external deterioration, visual characteristics. We look at probing techniques. I'll show you some of those. As well as we then will go through and look at internal technologies for deterioration, or detecting deterioration simple sounding techniques, drilling and coring techniques, ultrasound or sound wave type technologies, and simple moisture meters. Those are all very good tools that you can use to get an idea of what's going on inside a wood member. Let's start off with the visual inspection. For you folks that haven't done wood inspections, I don't know what you see, but I got to tell people always look for the obvious. Um, and I'm going to show you some photos in just a second here that show you some obvious things that you would never think would happen in the field, but they do. Uh, things I look for are foundation failures. Is the floor level? Are there cracks in the wall? Is there settlement? Uh, one of the major things I've seen is the sleeper members that they put on concrete foundations that are wood if they don't use treated wood material or a highly durable species in that, those will fail and as a consequence they will deteriorate and you'll get sloping of the building because of their failure in compression. Um, those are really good indicators of what's going on. Signs of distress, I'll show you some photographs of this. Any collapsed, failed members, any de excessive deflection, um, make note of those, then follow up to see what's going on. Any missing members? Now, you may be chuckling, but I'll show you a photo of that in a second. Fruiting bodies, as I said, any kind of biological deterioration that you see, please note it and be extremely uh, leery of any kind of, uh, uh, th those probably are significantly deteriorated. Once you start seeing fruiting bodies on it, you've got a major loss 
aid capacity. Any sunken faces, any members that sunk or localized surface depressions where we have one or two members sitting on top of another member, if they sink in there, that's usually an indication that there's a pr problem. Big things, staining or discoloration. I'll show you a photograph of that. That's usually an indication of moisture intrusion. And as we said before, if there's moisture intrusion, bells and whistles should go off in our heads that, hey, there's a potential problem here. Any plant or moss growth in any of the splits or cracks you see, when those cracks form, they're an ideal place for water to puddle and any of these biological agents to get into the wood member. And it's, uh, we'll get plant growth in there, we'll get moss growth in there, and needless to say, that's not a good thing. Those really happen a lot on timber bridges and some of our uh, structures that are more external than internal. Any evidence of insect damage? Uh, termites, ants, I'll show you some photos of that. Um, that's a major problem. And, as, and in addition to that, any fire damage. There's a whole chapter devoted to post-fire assessment of structures in the condition assessment manual. Make note of that. That chapter is very well written, and it, and it really goes into detail on what to look for and how to come up with allowable design values and residual capacity for members that have been exposed to fire. Let's just go over a couple of these real quick. Um, my missing members one, I apologize for the quality of this, but it was an actual inspection I was involved with. Um, the gentleman I was working with, a consulting engineer, we were doing some light frame construction inspection work, and he called me and asked me if uh, this, this particular homeowner had decided that they wanted to take their attic material, attic area and turn it into useful space, livable space, they took a skill saw and basically cut all the webs out of their trusses. And they call us here at the laboratory and the question to me was, is that a good thing to do? And I hopefully you folks are chuckling because that is not a good thing to do. But look for the obvious. I mean, a lot of people would overlook this simply because any of us in engineering or dealing with wood would tell you you just can't do those kinds of things. But look for the obvious. Look for anything that can be done with a skill saw any repairs, modifications, and think of the, the absolute limits on that and then go one or two standard deviations from that and you'll probably get them. Another classic one, um, I throw this one in here. This is an inspection we did on a historic structure in Pennsylvania. It's some floor joists on a building that was put together in about 1865, 1870. Actually, it was, the first, uh, it was the home of the first chief of the U.S. Forest Service. Anyway, we went into there, and you can see a couple things. We've got floor joists uh, sitting on a concrete foundation, which is not a problem. They're, it's pretty good. Uh, the problem with this is, is I never recommend that we cut the bottom side of a tension member to put any kind of uh, electrical or any kind of uh, conduits or anything in there. It's just it's not good practice. Now, I don't have a photograph of this, but I get a lot of phone calls in. Um, I'm sure most of you folks have dealt with the new free prefabricated wood eye joists that are on the market. Great products, highly engineered. They have solid wood or laminated wood. Flan uh, excuse me. Uh, they have an OS oriented strand board composite flange, and uh, top and bottom members are the uh, either uh, solid sawn material or Per, uh, laminate veneer lumber. Um, I always tell people that the conduits should go in the flange. That's where all the prefabricated punch outs are. And when they call in and ask me if it's okay to cut the bottom cords off those eye joists, I have to tell them that that is not recommended practice. That is not a good thing to do. Uh, again, messing members obvious things. Uh, the great part about wood is it's easy to fix and repair. The bad thing about engineered wood is that everybody thinks they know what they're doing and they can fix or repair it. So for us in the inspection part of it, we've got to be, we've got to notice those things. And um, 
I don't have any specific pictures of that, but I'm sure you can all imagine what happens when you take uh, uh, those bottom members off a, a prefabricated eye joist and cut them across the whole floor system. It is just not a really good thing to do. So anyway, that's things. The other thing that I tell people to look out for, and especially when we get into treated wood products, Treatments in wood have, for biodeterioration, protection, those kinds of things have varied over the years. We've gone from creosote treated, the heavy black uh, coal tar preservative that was used you know, for the last century, to uh, pentachlorophenol, which was taken off the market, and then CCA treated, which now has been uh, changed. A lot of those treatments have a detrimental effect on the wood, and they have a detrimental effect on metal fasteners. And so when I see treated wood and I see metal fasteners, this is a metal plate connected truss in some treated materials. When I start to see the kinds of uh, corrosion that I'm seeing here, I really get very concerned and I tell people to be very cautious of this. Now, there's, it's not necessarily bad, but be cautious because in this particular case, the fingers from that uh, truss plate actually penetrate into the wood and are in direct contact with the preservative chemical, I mean, usually they're salt-based. If there's moisture expand, excuse me, if there's moisture exposure coupled with the, the natural moisture that's in the wood, you can get a reaction in there that will cause uh, significant corrosion of those fasteners and a major reduction in load carrying capacity. Um, the fasteners will lose either thickness or cross section. The, the the fingers may actually deteriorate to the point that they're no longer connected to the plate. And, and the chemical byproduct will actually attack the wood also. This is one class of materials that we're a little cautious on. You've got to be very cautious on to make note of. Many of the preservative treatments embrittleize the wood, um, and especially some of the older treatments will embrittleize it to the point that it, they uh, change the wood from a ductile material to a quasi-brittle material. So uh, I always tell people be very cautious of that and be very cautious when you're designing that when you see that. Make good note of it, and um, just be careful because it's it's especially some of the older formulations. The newer ones have we've really tried our best to help the industry, and they've done a great job at trying to mitigate some of those issues. But there's still older material out there, and just just be a little cautious of it. Now, having said that, when you do your wood identification or you look at some of those things, see if you can get a piece out. And one of the things I always recommend is have somebody take a look at it from a chemical perspective and see what's in there, because that'll help you out too. Um, this is a specific one I wanted to show you when we talked about two things. One are failed or collapsed members, and I want to talk to you about moisture intrusion. Um, this came out of a building that my first inspection I was involved with was the football stadium at Washington State University. Now, Washington State University is located in an arid environment in eastern Washington. Pac-10 school. I worked on this about too, too long ago to remember, but uh, when I was a student, um, and all I can tell you is we're very fortunate that the WSU did not have a very good football team at the time because this we went in and inspected this part of the structure and it was in pretty bad shape. What you have here is some large timbers. These timbers were Douglas fir and they are treated with the preservative creosote. Um, the center member is in compression perpendicular to the fiber axis, and you can see that the outside of it actually buckled. And if you look on the right-hand side, I think it's very illustrative of why that happened. Douglas fir is a great structural material, but it does not take preservative very well because of its cellular structure. There's some certain unique characteristics of the cell walls that will not let the preservative infiltrate very deeply. As a consequence of that, you'll just, as is shown in that schematic or that artist rendition on the right-hand side, you'll just see an outer shell that's actually treated material. That split on the top, if those are deep enough, they'll actually penetrate down into the untreated wood. Water will migrate down in there from rain or whatever, and it makes a perfect environment for decay fungi to grow. If you look in that structure, uh, excuse me, that on the photograph on the left-hand side, that's exactly what happened on that. We did a post-mortem on it. 
and the inside of that particular member was completely deteriorated. All that was left was the outer shell of treated wood. And under compression, perpendicular to the fiber axis, it failed, and the outside, mem the outside side of that just buckled out. Excellent example of a, of a member that's failed. When I see something like that, I, everything goes off and says that's probably why it happened. Uh, definitely the load carrying capacity of this member has been compromised and it would have to be replaced or removed. The other thing that's very, very telling on this particular photograph is those members are resting on a concrete foundation, if you will, and there's nothing wrong with that in general, but when I, when I do inspections, the first thing I look at is multiple materials, and this, because it was a football stadium, it was an external application, perfect place for water to puddle, perfect place for water to accumulate and migrate into the wood members. So you had a combination of wood, water, probably some splits and cracks, the oxygen can get in there, and as a consequence, you had some severe deterioration from fungal attacks. So both of those photos and everything associated with this slide are in the wooden timber condition assessment manual. But when you see something like that, that's probably what's happened. Be aware and, and note that that member, in essence, should be repaired or replaced. Another visual thing, and again, I apologize, this is an older slide, but when we talk about mixing and matching materials, this is the end of a barrel arch in a laminated structure. Um, uh, and you see here a couple things. Number one, you see some concrete footing for, for support. You see big timber bolt, big bolts that were used there. So you've got steel, wood, and concrete. Over top of that, you've got flashing. Really what you have is a perfect place for biodeterioration or fungal growth to happen. If I was to design in the laboratory a perfect place to have decay happen, I'd have wood, I'd have oxygen, and I'd have a cover for it so that it would stay nice and warm and moist. And that's what this did. And as a consequence of that, the water would puddle up on the concrete, be absorbed into the end grain of the wood, migrate its way up, and uh, because it never really had a chance to dry out, was kept in the sunshine in a nice, warm environment, uh, we had deterioration and decay happening in there. So what I always recommend, if at all possible, if, for these types of things from an inspection standpoint, can you remove the flashing? Can you remove some of these things and actually get in there and take a look at it? Because uh, again, when we've got different materials and we've got access to wood, water, and moisture, we've got a potential problem. One of the things I talked about before was evidence of water damage. This is uh, the ceiling of a building we did up in northern Wisconsin on the shores of Lake Superior. It's owned by the Red Cliff Band of the uh, 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 one of our native tribes. and. Um, the roof was pretty uh, um, compromised. What this shows is significant water damage. And while it's, it's mold, and it probably is not a major problem, mold is not a problem from a strength reduction standpoint, the indication that there was that much water damage and that much leakage in there prompted us to pull that, sh that roof, uh, excuse me, that's the ceiling tiles down and to get up in there and actually look at the structural members. And as a consequence of that, um, that's what we did. So when I see things like that, I wanted to point out to you that it's a sign of moisture damage. It's a sign of moisture intrusion. And when you see that, be very wary and take a look at it. OK, we're going to take a little couple polling questions here. I'll turn it over to Marcy. All righty. Here we go. Corrosion of metal fasteners can create a chemical byproduct I'm sorry, I've got something in the way, so I can't see it. Can create chemical byproducts which attack wood. Is that true or false? And most everybody is voting. There is a standout answer, so I think everybody has been paying attention. <laughs> that should be a pretty easy one. I... All right. And, oh, man, okay, there we go. 80% voted. 
So close the poll, share the answer. 90% say true, 10% false, and the answer is true. True. Okay. And I think is there another poll question right after this? There's a next one here, Marcy. All right. Let me share that. Oh, I just shared the same thing. Sorry. These poll questions run right after another are kind of throwing me. Sorry. Um, visual inspection and condition assessments should take into account the items including plant moss growth in splits or cracks, missing members, staining or discoloration, or all of the above. All right. Everyone's voting. Boy, that you all are quick today on the voting. That's awesome. All right. 80% have voted. I'm going to go ahead and close and share. 99% have voted all of the above, <laughs> and nobody has voted elsewhere. So that's pretty impressive. I don't know where the 1% is, but um, that's pretty good. Well, hey, thank you guys. We'll go on to the next one. Uh, um, I want to cover quickly some of the inspection equipment that we use in our in our assessments. What you've got is a photo in front of you that's just got a range of tools and technologies. They range from simple automotive feeler gauges to increment bores that are used by foresters to uh, advanced drilling techniques to ultrasound-based technologies. So. All of them are discussed in detail in the Condition Assessment Manual, as well as where you can get them, where you could rent them from, how to use them, and how to interpret data from them. Um, so I'm not going to go into gory details of every instrument. I'll tell you this. We have worked with virtually every single type of technology I'm going to present, and they all add value, and they all can help in an assessment. Um, let's look at uh, sounding. Sounding is a very commonly used technique. Uh, it does require some skill, and it only gives you a partial picture of the, the extent of decay. It doesn't tell you how severe it is, where it is. And the key point here is it does not detect decay in its earliest stages. So usually by the time that that kind of thing is good for you, it, it's severely deteriorated and definitely needs some attention. So. Sounding with a simple hammer works quite well, but uh, um, uh, increment borers. This is a forestry tool that we use. Uh, a lot of our colleagues in the forestry profession use it to get age growth or growth rings on trees. Basically, it's a hollow tube that is inserted or drilled in by hand into a tree, or in this case, a wood member, and it provides a core sample. You pull that core sample out, and it tells you a lot of things. It can tell you if there's a void there and the extent of the void. So it gives you a really good indication of how much net section is left. It also allows you to take those core samples out. You can put them in a little plastic bag, and you can, you can send them to a laboratory and get them analyzed for the presence or absence of decay, if you really go to that extent. Some people can use those, uh, would indicate that you can use those for a potential species identification. That may be enough in many cases to do a species, a species ID. The thing I use them a lot for is to determine the presence or absence of a preservative treatment and how deep that preservative penetrated into the section. So very good tool, very inexpensive. We've used them all. They're in the book. Uh, probably pick one up from the neighborhood of a couple hundred dollars. So one thing I do recommend for anybody using these, please, when you pull those things out, replug them. You can buy preservative treated wooden dowels or wooden dowels of a, spe of a species that is um, uh, very decay resistant, like an oak or something like that. Because I've seen people where they do a great job on all this, and they put an aspen plug in there, and it's a perfect thing for decay. So. Great tool, great technology, very inexpensive, really good on heavy timber construction inspection work. We use it a lot. Um, resistance drilling. Resistance drilling is a, really what it is. It's, uh, it grew out of the concept a lot of us used in the past that the 
torque resistance for a drill going into wood is strongly correlated to uh, the density, and we found out later, to the capacity of the wood members. People have actually commercialized that. So it's very good for locating decay and termite damage. Uh, as we talk about here, the drill resistance is very cor well correlated with density. What it does is measures the relative resistance as a rotating, rotating drill bit is driven into the wood, and it displays that relative density profile as it goes across the member. So it's a really nice tool. There's several different places you can get it. Again, it's in the Wood and Timber Condition Assessment Manual. I use these things a lot, uh, especially in heavy timber construction. Um, and it'll give you a profile. They have uh, equipment that can be hooked right up to a laptop, and you can download the uh, results. It is extremely good at picking up decay and decay areas in standing timber as well as for heavy timber construction. So we use it a lot. Um, ultrasound or stress wave ba based technologies, in, 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 excuse me, basically what we look for here, it works on really good on heavy timber construction. We try to send a sound wave perpendicular to the axis of the fiber, so across the member. Very good with heavy timber construction. We use it a lot. What we found is that the speed of sound transmission is extremely sensitive to the absence or presence of decay. Well known now, well published, good baseline laboratory work as well as a lot of fabric, uh, uh, field work to support that. Uh, basically what happens is, is that most of these pieces of equipment, and there's probably a half a dozen different manufacturers of it, they take and they put a, some kind of sensor on one side of the wood and, they, and a corresponding sensor right across the member. And it imparts a wave to flow through the wood. And it simply measures the time it goes from A to B. And knowing that, we can get an indication of what the speed is. And knowing what those speeds are for sound wood for various species, we can give you an indication of where, whether or not there's decay in there. So really is a, is a nice tool. We've used this a lot. Several different types. They're all in the wooden camera condition assessment manual. Uh, they range in price probably from about $1,500 to about $10,000, depending on what kind of um, data acquisition, what kind of printouts you want. But uh, well-established technology now and used quite a bit. Uh, there's a whole chapter, because these are used so frequently, there's a whole chapter de dedicated to their use. And there's tables in there on various wood species that tell you what baseline values are for good sound material. Another thing we use quite a bit is moisture content. As I've said several times that the wood needs moisture for the decay to come in and take it. Normal use for wood is, uh, for sound wood, we figure that the moisture content should be somewhere around 6 to 12 percent especially inside buildings. It gets lower than that in the winter up here in northern Wisconsin. Um, exterior moisture content should be somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 percent. When we start to see moisture contents above 20, 30, definitely 30 percent, we start getting concerned that their potential is there for biodeterioration. And so one tool that's used extensively in the wood industry is a moisture meter. And we recommend them as an initial check on the moisture content of wood. And there's a whole series of guidelines on moisture meters, where to get them, uh, how to interpret them. They basically use the measure the electrical resistance of the wood. And we found that that's very indicative of what the moisture content is or what the moisture levels are within the wood. And it's a very inexpensive, well-adapted technology. We use that a lot on a variety of structures. Now, having said that, it's not necessarily that the moisture's in there, but if moisture's in there, that's one of those three pieces that are necessary for decay and biodeterioration to happen. If the moisture content is low enough, we don't worry about it. But if it's high enough, then we have to be concerned that the potential is there. So um, really nice tool, very, very appropriate, and very relatively inexpensive. OK, Marcy, we got another polling question. All right, here we go. Let me pull that up. An increment borer can be used to determine the following. 
A, voids, B, presence of decay, species identification, D, preservative penetration, or E, all of the above. Alrighty, and we've got about 77%, 35 seconds, I'm going to go ahead and close right about now, and 94% say all of the above, and just a smattering elsewhere, so. That's right. Okay. Okay, um, I'm going to now, I've given you some background on wood as a material, some background on some of the things we see, the importance of wood and moisture interactions. Uh, the next phase of this presentation, we're going to look at some example evaluations. All of these are covered in the Wood and Timber Condition Assessment Manual in much more detail. Um, I'm going to try to get through some work we did on the oldest commissioned ship in the U.S. Navy, Old Ironsides. It has some very unique characteristics. Um, a school gymnasium with some barrel arches. A uh, trestle, which used to be the largest glued laminated structure in the world, and timber bridges. But before I start on that, I just are there any questions? And if so, feel free to type them in, and the folks at the Wood Council will accumulate them, and, and we'll try to answer them at the end. Is that fair, Marcy? Yeah, Bob, we could probably jump in just with um, one or two here um, right now. Um, so b before we do that, though, let me, um, we've got a lot of sharp uh, participants here. And when you were talking earlier about eye joists, um, you mentioned uh, notching or drilling holes in the uh, flange, and a lot of those folks um, piped up, kind of lit up our Q&A uh, window there and said that they are pretty sure you meant the web of the oh. eye joist is where those uh, holes and notches. Oh, definitely. I apologize. Yeah. The, yeah, the prefabricated yeah. punch outs are on the webs. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I just want to make sure that, we cleared that up. That, that lit it up. So I want to make sure yep. everybody knew. That's, no, that's exactly <laughs> right. The problem is cutting off the flanges. Right. So I apologize. Then, talk so that, many that, times. Yeah. Nope, nope, no worries. Um, the other one goes back to sampling, and I think there's two different sample sizes that you might need. If you're just doing species identification, somebody said, you know, I sent in a, a sample as small as a toothpick. Is that big enough for species identification? Then I think if you could talk about that and then talk about what sample size you'd need for physical testing, uh, maybe okay. that would help. Okay, all right. So that's great. Uh, I'm assuming everybody heard Buddy's question, so I won't repeat them. Uh, toothpick size is pretty small. I wouldn't go there. There's in the wooden timber condition assessment manual. I'm going to pull that up right now to that chapter. We wrote a whole manual on wood uh, sampling for um, for wood, and I'm going to look that up. I would say if you could come in with somewhere around a wood, uh, excuse me, a one by one sample, you'd be fine. I'd say an increment core size sample would be fine. Um, let me see. That would be fine. Uh, now, having said that, there are some folks that would tell you they could probably do it with a toothpick, but <laughs> most of the folks are doing it. Think of a, of a hand lens that mm -hmm. is very small and um, a 10 power lens and holding that piece up. So. If you could just notch out or take a piece out, uh, you know, maybe a half inch by half inch even, you'd be fine. Um, so you don't need a big section. Be careful where you take it from. Obviously, we don't want to take it on the tension side of any members that are in, that in, in bending or, or any tension members. We don't want to do that. So uh, hopefully that answers the question. Now, there are some people in a real bind would tell you they can do it with sawdust. Um, I'm not convinced of that, and I would not recommend that, but there are some people who would tell you they could. Uh, I recommend something in the neighborhood of half inch by half inch or an increment core. If you're doing heavy timber construction, they can get them from an increment core. And what was the other one, buddy? I forgot. 
Well, if you got to do physical testing, what length would you need? Okay, Maybe some doing doing physical test, yeah, that's a good question. You could do physical testing. Depends on what kind of properties you want. Uh, most of the small clear testing we do, uh, or anybody does, are, are controlled by ASTM standards. And the normal ones we talk about, ASTM D147, I think, buddy, I can't remember. But most of the small clear stuff, if you want to do, excuse me, bending tests, on a small clear specimen, they're basically, uh, what are they, buddy, three-quarter by inch and a half by about six, eight inches long. So you yeah. don't need a piece. So they're in that ballpark. Now, we can, people can do, and a lot of these test labs can test smaller specimens, but um, it, it depends on the property you want. Uh, uh, but what I would defer to, it would be the ASTM, D series for the committee on wood and look at those because that's usually what we're going to fall back on. Yeah, I think D245 is probably the one but, you're thinking about yeah. for... Uh, Not 198. 198 is the full size. Yeah, so, okay. Um, one other question, then I'll let you uh, keep on going so we don't run out of time. Any Some other questions? Are, yeah, they're wanting ballpark uh, costs on the... Uh, resistance drilling devices. Any ballpark estimates on that? Ballpark estimates on that. It depends who you, for the drilling resistance things. And I, and I just came back from a meeting on this. And uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, a couple thousand dollars up to 10000 That's what I heard. Now, okay. we have not purchased one in a while. A lot of that depends on what kind of bells and whistles you want on it. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you want, um, you know, to download it to your laptop or whether you go with uh, you know hard copy or some combination. Uh, they're constantly evolving on those things. The concept hasn't changed, but the evolution has led to more and more uh, ease of interpretation. So I'd say somewhere between uh, two, three thousand dollars up to ten. That's just okay. a round number. All right. All right. The websites and the contact information is in the chapter on the Wooden Timber Condition Center Manual. I'd recommend get on those websites and get a quote from them. All right, sounds good. Well, I'm gonna let you keep going so we don't run out of time for you to go through some of these case studies, and we'll pick up more of those questions at the end if we have time. Okay, photos and everything are good, buddy. Everything yep, good. Yep, good to go. Okay, the first one I want to talk about. Thank you guys for the great questions. Thanks for catching me on that iJoyce one. It's yeah, it's yeah. Thank you. I've just done too many of these. Anyway, the first really inspection I want to talk with you about. It's not a uh, building per se, but it is a very unique wooden structure. Uh, it's old Ironsides, USS Constitution, and I want to highlight that because there's some unique things in there, and it highlights some of the things we've talked about in the, in the prior part of this discussion. That's a picture of old Ironsides after uh, her dry dock in the late 1990s. It's a very interesting ship. It was commissioned by President George Washington, and construction started on it, just some interesting facts, in 1794. It actually cost, and I got these numbers off the historic site, down to the penny, $302,718.84. Um, I'm not convinced we have our budget quite that tight anymore in the federal government. About 200 foot long, when it was sailing, we had a crew of 40, 400 on it, never defeated in battle. It's still a part of the United States Navy. It's the oldest commissioned ship in the world. We have about a million visitors, plus or minus, that go through that ship from all over the world. Um, I want to tell you that it, um, we got called into it as a federal laboratory and as the nation's wood research laboratory. We've been involved with it and the inspection of it numerous times. I was fortunate enough to be in here when they did it for the dry dock just prior to the launch, uh, anniversary of its 200th anniversary. Um, and in that particular case, we went through the ship. And uh, I just want to share with you some of the uh, unique characteristics of it. It's all wooden, above waterline, below waterline. And what you'll see in this photograph, it's from a very unique species of wood. And that's where we go to the species identification part. That is, quote unquote, a live oak tree. It's, it's not just alive, but the species is Quercus. I forget the species name, but that's the genus name. 
but the common name is, quote, live oak. It's very dense. It, does, it grows in a very spreading format like that. It has some very unique characteristics of it. Um, it is very strong. It's very, very decay resistant. And it is very, very resistant to impact loads. Uh, but it grows in a sprawling type of tree like that. It doesn't grow straight up. It doesn't have a straight a bowl like we do in the others. So um, what I want to point out to you is how important that is in, in, in the design of it. The ship itself, if you look back at that tree, you'll see various uh, branches that go out. The neat thing about that is when a tree forms branches like that, the fibers actually flow along that curvature. So it's, it's not like when we connect things together and we put two pieces together and put a plate on it. They actually flow there. So they're very strong that way. The folks, when they built that ship, took advantage of that. And they used every piece of every one of those trees they could get. And here's just an example of what they did. They had some straight sections that they used for various straight sections. But they used knees for braces. They used some of the, the bowed areas for braces. I'll show you some pictures of that. But very, very unique. Great understanding of wood as a material. And um, did just a fantastic job at utilization of that material. Very, very unique. Uh, I got to tell you, too, that, that what was unique about this was that it was, at that time, our private or our secret weapon. Because this species of wood only grows in the southeastern part of the United States. It doesn't grow up north here. It doesn't grow in the west. So it was kind of the, the secret material that, uh, that they used. This is just a, a, a model of the ship. It's multi-layered, um, all wood construction held together by copper and metal drift pins. This is a size, uh, example. When we were asked to do the inspection, the first thing we did is we made a mock-up of the hull. This is a mock-up, actual full-size mock-up of the hull of old iron sides. Uh, what I want to show you is that it's a cross-laminate construction um, that is solid oak just under two foot thick. So in the, in the outer laminations, the ones facing us in a horizontal direction, most of the fibers were in the direction of the, of the member. In the rib members, they were perpendicular. And in the back side of that, they had another layer that was like the front layer, all solid oak, two foot thick. Um, the pins there were copper. Um, if you can imagine, they didn't have electrical power tools there or pneumatics. Everything was either by hand or water driven. All those are drilled and pounded by hand into the ship. Um, what I want to tell you, too, is that the siding of this, it, because of the structure of the wood, the density of it, the durability of it, it has remained floating for over 200 years. But because of that construction technique, it really was good at repelling cannonballs. It absorbed energy, dissipated it, and would flex a little bit. But it really is a very, very good material for that application. We were called in because um, there were a couple of things that were going on. Uh, in the ship itself, we had hogging going on, which is the fore and after the ship were actually drooping. And as a consequence, the keel was, was, was becoming elevated. And we noticed that was happening over a period of time. This ship has its own budget line item in the federal budget. So it's, this is a very important the history of the United States. We were given the mission that this thing has to float forever. And um, so uh, in addition to fixing and repairing these kinds of things, we had to make sure that we preserved as much of the original materials. Just for your knowledge, if you ever want to look it up, there was an article written on what we did in the July 1996 version of National Geographic. The inspection techniques we used, visual and including photographs. We used some photographs that bent, went back uh, quite a way. We used ultrasound techniques. We used some radiography, did some chemical tests, and then some mechanical tests on the ship. Just a little bit here, we want to tell you that one of the problems that contributed to that hogging was the copper pins. Um, it's estimated there was about 50 tons of copper pins used below the waterline 
uh, of the ship to hold that thing together. And there was an equal amount of um, iron pins above water lines. So a total of about 100 tons of pins. Ironically, all the material below the water line, or most, uh, yeah, in essence, all the material below water line um, is original. And a lot of those original pins came out of Paul Revere's shop. And you could see his logo stamped on the, bottom, uh, the, on the head of those pins. Anyway, one thing we saw was uh, we used some ultrasound and x-ray techniques to look at the actual characteristics of the pins. And we saw some deterioration of the pins. No decay in the wood, but we did see some metal sickness around them. Um, in addition to that, we saw, when we brought her to dry dock, we did start to see some deterioration. And we did run some mechanical tests on some other material we had of the same species that had been preserved, and we and some from the ship. And we noticed we did some compression tests with the fasteners, and we did notice a significant drop off, not in the strength, but in the stiffness of those joints. And we attributed that to the cause of the hogging in the ship. This is just a photograph of her. You can see her just outside. This is the dry docking prior to her going in. Now. What I want to tell you, and this goes back to the wood-air interaction kind of thing, the only place we found decay, the most of the place we found decay in the ship, were right at or just below or above the water line. And what we saw was below water line, no real deterioration, all original material. And why? There's water there and there's wood there, but there's no oxygen. Above water line and above that zone, the moisture content was low, so you didn't have that. Right at that water line, above and beyond, uh, excuse me, above and below that just a little bit is where we saw deterioration. We were able to map that out, and we were able to determine which pieces had to be removed and had to be replaced. Um, the other thing that was very interesting on, and I wanted to share with you, is that in this particular case, because of its historical significance, we did everything we could to put the same species of wood back in it. Ironically, when George Washington commissioned this ship and dedicated it, he planted live oak trees, seedlings, on his plantation. And it's documented that he made the statement, as a lot of our politicians do, that some good things are going to happen. And he said that the wood from these trees will be used in 200 years from now in the repair of this ship. Well, those trees were actually came down in a hurricane about 20 years, 20, 25 years ago. They were taken, they were preserved, and they were put in a pond, and they were kept. And those trees, the wood from those trees, was actually used in the repair of the ship. The Forest Service, my bosses, actually went back and per, uh, planted the next generation of live oak trees for the next 200 year out. So it, it's a really good story about wood, engineering, understanding about wood, durability, and also about the sustainability and what we can do with wood as a sustainable engineering material. Next one I want to touch base on is the school gymnasium. And these I'm just going to quickly go through. But I apologize for the quality. These are older slides, but they really highlight some unique things. These are all the gymnasiums that were built in the 70s, uh, some of the first glued laminated timber arches that were built. And um, the, main, the main support structure, this was in Rathrum, Idaho, uh, were laminated barrel arches. They were laminated dug fir, uh, dug with fir. Excuse me. The problem area was at the arch ends that was exposed to weather and rested on a concrete foundation. You can see it there on the right-hand side. Uh, it had some very heavy painting on it, lead-based, ironically, but it was not allowed to dry out. Uh, as a consequence, there was some indication of decay because there was a lot of cracking and peeling of the paint. So the inspection was, the, the goal here was, again, to go back what we talked about, looking for moisture things and then doing your inspection based on that, looking at where wood, water, other materials interact and then looking for decay in that area. And what they did is they used, here's a close-up of it. We had wood, steel, fasteners, and concrete. 
And what we found was, again, a perfect place. These are untreated members, so there was no preservative in there. Uh, the water would migrate up the specimen, perfect place for decay to happen. Used a variety of techniques, um, and especially stress wave techniques, And because at that time the probing or resistance drilling was not that far along. But this is what I'll show you from one of those older reports, and it's in detail in the one chapter of, in the condition assessment manual. But very similar to what you see on a tooth decay problem. That's the side view of a schematic of one of those arches. And the numbers on there are indicative of the time it took the wave to go through. We started near the end and worked our way out. And you can see that dashed line represents where we found decay and deterioration based on stress wave times. And basically, we knew what good sound wood would be, those lower numbers. And we knew when we hit decay because of deterioration, how bad those numbers, or how much those numbers would change. And as a consequence, we could map out where the decay was and make appropriate repair recommendations. So worked out really well. What I'd recommend today for something like this in what we do is when we get a map like this, we always follow up with some kind of drilling, coring, or micro-resistance drilling to to verify our findings and just make a complete package. But really one of the first works done on a very nice piece of technology and a very nice piece of science. Trestle, uh, I want to show you a picture of trestle. It's one of the largest structures in the world. I don't know if it's the largest anymore, buddy. You can correct me. Here's what it looks like. It, that is an actual B-52 that was on the structure. It's located in the New Mexico desert, very arid. It was constructed between 76 and 79. Uh, it was a test stand for aircraft. And it was composed almost entirely of wood. Even uh, the pins in there were wood composites. And um, the platform was about 200 foot square. And it had a height of 118 feet. So uh, one of my good friends and colleagues, Don Neal, was asked to go out and do a condition assessment on it. Uh, of all the members there, he tested just about 5% of the total. That it was just shy of 500 total Blue Lamb members. Now, what he did is went through there using visual techniques, as well as some of our ultrasound techniques, parallel, perpendicular to the grain, to look for decay. Now, I can tell you that it was an, it's in a very arid environment. In essence, they found no signs of decay and no deterioration from decay. So um, that was good. But in addition to that, they showed a slight deterioration in, this, in, uh, in the decks. And they recommended some replacement of the decking material. What they also recommended was, if they did that, to, it would be OK to increase the design loads to accommodate ultimate aircraft. So very important, but uh, very intensive, very, very well done, well documented. It's in the condition assessment manual. And the key is there, if you really want to get into it, it's one of the very first assessments where they took some of those NDE technologies and actually used them to derive allowables or more uh, allowable design values. It's an excellent example. I recommend it highly. It's a great paper, um, and it's available in, that, in the manual. OK. I'm going to now go to timber bridges. And timber bridges, we've done a lot of work on timber bridges. Uh, for non-destructive evaluation, everything from visual inspection technologies through um, laser technologies. I didn't incorporate that because that's still in a research phase, but just some beautiful work. Most of our work with timber bridges has been in cooperation with our industry co uh, colleagues, such as the American Wood Council and some of our uh, uh, wood manufacturers and manufacturers of bridges, but also um, with the Federal Highway Administration. They've been an outstanding partner with us on this. They come to the laboratory on a pretty much uh, regular basis because of our wood technology and wood, wood engineering knowledge. So variety of bridges from single span, multi-span, uh, stringer bridges, uh, solid sawn, glued laminated bridges, different species, uh, just a whole realm of, of uh, activities on it. So. And they have funded over the years a whole series of looks at uh, studies looking at various non-destructive evaluation technologies and inspection methods 
for timber bridges. I'm going to just show you one of the ones we did recently. This is a timber bridge that was in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, uh, it was constructed in 1946. It's nail-laminated decks, uh, and it was in a three-span configuration. The deck was replaced in about 2000. Um, this goes back to what I talked about with the Douglas fir and the treating issue. Some of the concerns were there was significant checking and hence uh, exposure of the internal members, internal wood and some of those members in the timber substructure. And there was considerable uncertainty about their, how that's going to affect the load rate analysis and their ultimate load carrying capacity. So what we did is used a lot of different techniques, but I want to leave one here with you that I think is very, very important. I uh, looked at the, the size of the members, did micro uh, drilling assessment, and but one of the techniques we found out was very simple but still very useful was simply using a metal feeler gauge that you can get in any of your hardware stores or auto repair stores to determine the extent and the depth of the checks. Uh, that depth is a really important thing when it comes into the amount of preservation that went in there. Um, and also, when we talk about designing fasteners and connection systems, how well um, the wood's going to behave or what we got to take into design in those, in those uh, designs. So anyway, it's, it's a really important thing. Um, what we found out was that there was some deterioration. We actually brought some of those members back here and built up some of those bents and actually tree, uh, tested them. And we found out that in some cases the actual load carrying capacity was diminished, mostly because there was deterioration on the ends of some of the members for just like we talked about before. There were some larger splits that had developed. It had compromised the preservative wood envelope, if you will, and as a consequence we had water intrusion, uh, decay, and as a consequence deterioration of the wood and a significant reduction in their load carrying capacity. So. Um, Really great thing. Uh, I will tell you that we're doing some other work in the timber bridge area, uh, and it's in the Wooden Timber Condition Assessment Annual that, that I didn't publish or bring out here. We've recently embarked on a, on a study on historic covered bridges where we're actually using laser technologies to get as-built records of timber bridges. And so we've used some laser scanning of overall bridges, and now we've got a pretty good technology in our toolbox to help us to get as-built records of those. I didn't bring that up today. If you want another webinar on it, we'd be happy to do it, but some really interesting technology there. Buddy, I'm getting close to the end here. I want to open it up to questions. Um, uh, where can you find information on evaluation, maintenance, and repair of existing structures? I'm going to close out and go back to these two really important documents for you folks. The one on the right is the Wooden Timber Condition Assessment Manual. Everything I covered today, plus some, is in that. It's available in a PDF format. Please use it. Take it. And, uh, and it's going to cover a lot of things I probably overlooked or probably understated or misstated. Uh, really good document, and it's been uh, uh, well-reviewed and well-received. Ironically, we, we had uh, great support from AWC, American Wood Council, and Buddy his, and his staff at reviewing it and providing input, and we, we sure appreciate that, and hopefully you enjoy it uh, and find it useful. On the cover, you'll see some of the things we have done inspections of, just their artist rendition, but there's old iron sides. We recently did some work for the city of Beijing in China and the cultural ministry. Uh, department in the city of China, of Beijing, uh, to come up with inspection methodologies and assessment procedures for all their historic structures, which is a very interesting uh, effort and we'll be publishing that soon. Down on the bottom is a historic trout rearing station that's on, excuse me, in Upper Michigan that's on the site of the last the trout ranger station where the last grayling trout was caught east of the Mississippi River, so it's pretty cool. Uh, uh, CCC built building in the 1930s. Um, and up in the top is that mummy coffin I spoke about. Uh, if you want, there's a publication on our website that talks about that coffin in detail and what we did. 
um, in some of the technologies. If you want to see it, uh, check on the website of the Nelson Adkins Museum of Art, and there was a whole display on the mummy coffin. Excellent example of using wood in an arid environment, keeping it dry, and having wood last indefinitely if you if you really watch what you're doing with it. The second document, and again, it's 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 a great one to have in your back pocket, um, uh, is uh, the wood handbook. I went through a lot of that with you, or just hit some of those chapters. Please use it; it's there. Uh, we get a lot of downloads on it. It's been reviewed extensively, and it's it's really a nice compilation. I don't know if I told you this, but that document has evolved. It was first published by the Forest Products Laboratory, I think, 1935. And uh, I don't know what edition we're on now. I know we named this our centennial edition because we prepared it in the anniversary of our first 100 years of service. So, uh, But there's various uh, versions of it out there. I recommend you get the latest, uh, and it is available off our website. So with that, I'll turn it back, I think, to Marcy. Actually, Bob, it's, yeah. it's, going to be, it's going to be me, and we're going to do some Q&A now. Um, we've got plenty okay. of time to, to work through questions, and the questions are, are rolling in. So no, no particular order, um, but you, one of the last ones you finished up with uh, showed some examples of splits and checks um, in the columns. Talk that a little one. bit. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I am, I'm sorry. I am going to interject here just real quick. Sure. I do want to remind everybody to please stay on um, for the questions and answers because we are just at 3.36, so if you do leave now, you will not meet your requirement for the time. Great. Thanks, Marcy. Yeah, so uh, folks, stick around. This will be part of the, the seminar to get you your two hours of credits. Um, but, Bob, on this slide, talk a little bit about you know, the, the grading rules that allow splits and checks and shakes in timbers like this. And actually, um, when, when they're graded uh, wet uh, or green, anticipate this occurring. And then how do you begin to determine when that exceeds the, the grade rules and, and it begins to affect the strength or load carrying capacity of these members? Uh, boy, that's a, that's a loaded question. That's a tough one. Um, uh, yes, it, let's go back. When, when, these, when these members are first graded uh, before they're put in a structure, and if you go to the chapter, it has within that, they have specific guidelines for various grades and grade combination of what kind of checks, depths um, that, are, that are allowed for various, um, for various grades. And those grades will actually determine, as a con uh, will determine the various allowable design values. Generally speaking, with, with, and they vary based on uh, species and species groupings. Uh, generally speaking, the fewer the number and the, the, the smaller the check and the split, the higher the grade you're going to get and the higher allowable value, generally speaking. Um, in the field, my number one concern is not so much in where they are, but is in the their ability or their contribution to water intrusion and to decay. And that's why when I see things like that, uh, while they, they are important in and of themselves, what's more important, and I don't have a slide of it here, but in these particular ones, you could see where water came up in there and you could see the core of those pieces or those columns were severely deteriorated and uh, brown crumbly wood, water damaged wood, that's what caused the major problem. And so when I see these, what's more important is following up with um, some kind of look, into, for a better word, internal to them, whether it's an increment core, mm -hmm. a boring device, or a simple uh, feeler gauge to get some idea of whether there's an absence or presence of deterioration in there. It's to me, it's not so much that the checks are there, but it's where are they and where it could be, for example, or what it could do. For example, on this particular one, what's concerning to me on the left is that they're in there and they're so close to the ground that you're going to get a lot of moisture intrusion. 
you're probably, and I, I don't have the resolution on there, but you're going to get um, plant growth. You're going to get some dirt in there. You're going to get mold. You're going to get some fungal growth. And then we start deterioration. That, to me, is a bigger issue. But having said that, if you go into the chapter on, uh, and, I, and I, I'm not trying to dance around it too much, but it's, it's a loaded question, and there's a lot of data on that. And uh, it would take me a long time, but there's there's some examples on there on um, largest knots, slope of grain. Um, let me see. Estimation of dissolvable design values, checks and splits. Take a look at that. I think that'll that'll answer the question for your specific applications better than I could over this. Is okay. That fair? Yeah, yep. that's great. That's great. Okay. So um, you talked a little bit too about naturally durable species. So let's talk a, a little bit about uh, what some of those are. Uh, and I've got some code um, language here about some of that too. And then um, maybe we can transition over to some of the preservative treated species that are easy to treat and which ones are maybe a little more difficult to treat. So let's let's talk naturally durable first. Okay, I just, uh, can you hear me okay? I just went to the wood yep. handbook. I've got it right in front of me, and I want to pull that right out. Um, let's first talk about some some uh, species of wood that are not very durable. Um, and while I'm thumbing through here to get those, uh, um, some of the woods that are not very durable would be things like aspen, cottonwood, uh, some of those lighter, whiter woods are really not very durable, and as a consequence, um, when I see those in a in a, um, a structure, I really uh, get pretty concerned. Um, if you look at the wood handbook in Chapter 14, Biological Deterioration of Woods, on Table 14.1, it's titled "Grouping of Some Domestic Important Wo and Imported Woods According to Average Hardwood Decay Resistance." The hardwood of the tree is, when you look at a log, it's the, usually the darker part, and the, the what we call a sapwood is the outer part. The heartwood is usually much more decay resistant than the sapwood. And the reason that is, is usually the heartwood will absorb up some uh, natural chemicals, and those chemicals are what we call extractives, add to the decay or biological attack resistance. Mm -hmm. But just to give you some ideas here, very resistant species, um, black locust. You've all maybe seen that or not, but it's a very resi resistant species. Redwoods, especially old growth, black walnut. Most of the white oaks are very decay resistant or resistant. Um, some of the cedars, western red cedar, eastern cedar, red cedar, white cedar, those are very resistant. Bald cypress, you're probably not going to see much of that. Um, kind of moderately resistant. Uh, most of your pines, your southern pines, your redwoods, your Douglas firs, those are what we would call moderately resistant with no treatment. So if you keep them dry, they're probably in pretty good shape. Slightly or non-resistant, your aspen, your beeches, your lower density woods, cottonwoods, some of your true firs, some of the pines we didn't list that are probably not used much for structural applications anyway. Right. Yellow poplar, um, balsam, those kinds of woods are not very decay resistant. So, But there's a whole table there, and look at them, and there's some really good, a lot of details on it, and there's some good research behind it if you want the exact publications. Yeah, so the, yeah it, it does. And just to clarify from a code uh, standpoint, the the code is very specific about, um, you know, uh, requiring 90% uh, more or more of the width of each uh, side being heartwood, and then the following species listed in the code are as decay resistant are redwood, cedar, black yep. locust, and black walnut, and then termite resistance includes redwood, Alaska yellow cedar, Eastern mm -hmm. red cedar and Western red cedar. So yes. uh, those are specifically listed in the code. 
let's talk a little bit about uh, preservative treatments then. Uh, I think you mentioned Doug fir. Um, talk a little bit about the refractory species like Doug fir, hem fir, uh, the incising sure. that's uh, done to uh, get the, okay. the preservatives okay. to penetrate. Sure. Okay. Well, for you folks, just to make your life easier, it, it's chapter 15 in the Wood Handbook. It's devoted just to wood preservation, wood preservatives. It's probably one of our most um, most used chapters, most widely downloaded. Um, to answer your question, uh, uh, buddy, um, the the wood wood structural wood is is composed of a bunch of fibers. So think about a bunch of straws all glued together you know, parallel to each other. That's kind of what the wood looks like. And if you look down that, you'll see these holes in there. And that's what we call a luminar. But each one of those, each piece of wood has a, a lot of those holes in there. Some of the species of wood um, allow water to, or liquids to penetrate down in there and then diffuse out or diffuse in. Some do not. For example, um, we just talked about how the white oaks are very decay resistant and in the code they're listed as a decay resistant species. The reason the white oaks are is because on those holes or those lumens there's certain growth characteristics that are basically skin like structures that go across those holes and will not let the water penetrate or the preservative penetrate in. So they don't take preservative well but the flip side is they don't absorb moisture that much and as a consequence the decay doesn't get a chance to go. So that's part of the reason for the oaks. Now for our structural woods like Douglas fir, Buddy brought that up, Douglas fir is a great great material. It's, it's relatively low density but it has great uh, performance characteristics, great structural material. But it has those tubes all lined up and they're pretty open on the ends which is a good thing. But if I go transverse to those, so across one of those tubes, they have little holes in the side of those tubes. And <clears throat> excuse me, in those holes is a little flap-like structure. And when we dry the wood out to prepare it to be used in a structural application, that flap closes up that little hole. And as a consequence, you can't push water through it. So as I showed in some of those older, those earlier slides, just a big timber of Douglas fir, if I tried to force liquid in from the sides, I would have a very difficult time. So one of the things that, that uh, the manufacturers of these do is a process we call incising. And incising simply means they have a device that actually puts slits along the length of the piece or into the wood and they allow that chemical to go into those slits and then permeate out a little bit more. So that gets it deeper into the Douglas fir. It's been a problem for many years with the species, but if they're done right, if it's maintained right, and the other thing is on Doug fir, if the end grain is sealed correctly and maintained seal, it's just done, it does very well. Yeah, along those lines, talk a little bit about uh, once a once a member's field cut. What are some um, okay. field applied treatments that can be used and some okay. best practices? That, that's a good question, and I and I and, and I uh, once we do field cutting on those, um, and I'll give you my first experience with that was on a deck. Somebody was so proud of the fact that they bought treated wood and they, they handled it well, did all those beautiful things to it. Uh, they cut the ends off and all I saw was unexposed wood. And I said, boy, we got a problem because what happens is with unexposed wood, it'll shrink and swell a little bit on that end when it gets wet or dries or vice versa. But it'll move, will get splits, and then that thing will get wet. It'll absorb that water up in there and then will get decay in there and it'll just march its way right down the piece. What I recommend on any of these, any time that barrier is broken, even with an increment core, if we break one of those, I recommend a field treatment. And a field treatment can be as simple as taking, and, and I'm not going to go, I'm not a chemist and I don't want to pretend to be one, I'd look in a wood handbook, but what I would do is get some preservative material that's available 
and I really recommend the, the ends are soaked. I recommend if there's any uh, big holes driven for connections, fasteners, I recommend a field treatment on there because, again, anything that compromises that, in essence, envelope opens up the idea or the potential for decay and deterioration. Yeah, the code talks about copper naphthenate as yeah. one uh, type of uh, field Copper naphthenate is treatment. very good, yeah. 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 So, yep. And there, there's others, and there's constantly evolving on there. But it, it, uh, the big thing is what I tell people, practical people in the field, is when you see a treated member, it usually has a color to it, green treated, uh, used to be penta and creosote, and then uh, the dark black was creosote. That's great. That tells you there's treatment in there. When you see any kind of wood in there that is untreated, we have a potential, and you have to do something to treat that. So anytime you've broken that envelope in any way, shape, or form, you've got to do something to do a remedial treatment. Okay. So I want to transition then to some repair uh, discussion, but we've had quite a few people asking about that Air Force trestle and what it was used for. Do you know the background on that? I've heard, but I, I'm not uh, uh, um, sure. What I heard from my, you know, it's before Buddy and my time, so I'm getting it from the literature. I know some of the guys that worked on it. My understanding of it is that that structure was built by the Defense Department in the middle of the Cold War, and it was built because they wanted to have a structure where they could take aircraft and subject them to an electromagnetic force field uh, without having the structure react. Right. And wood will not react to it. It's, it's not going to react to that. So wood was chosen because of that. Um, from what I understand, it's in, it's in Don Neal's paper, uh, they actually used a, a wood uh, phenolic-based bolts in their body, and uh, uh, with the whole idea they could submit the, expose that to electromagnetic force field, and it would not be influenced by the uh, the structure itself. That's what yeah. I would hold. Yeah, that's that's my understanding as well. So that's consistent. Good. It's very consistent. Now the neat part of that was, and where I go back to it, and. and Don Neal was the consulting engineer on it. He was out of the Portland, Oregon area, a great consultant, a great guy. One of the first guys to really do some, uh, what I'd say, a little bit advanced uh, work on inspection methodologies. He's since passed, but he put together a really good paper on it, and it's cited in the Conditional Assessment Manual. So if anybody wants, they can either get it out of there, or if they can't find it, I can find it for them. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks. Well, yeah. let's talk a little bit about uh, repairs. So, a lot of questions about epoxy repairs. Uh, share a little experience uh, on, uh, you know, from all the work that you've done about uh, epoxies and various repair uh, options for decay and, and things like that that you have some experience with. Sure. Uh, first, before I do, buddy, what? What's your recommendation on a code level for repair work for epoxies? Well, it's it's really um, kind of an engineering-based uh, approach. That's my call. So yeah, there's no nothing specific uh, that I'm aware of in the code that addresses epoxy. So it's it's based on what the manufacturer's literature provides, and then the engineer's uh, judgment with that. Okay. Well, my experience that's good because that's that's been my experience. Here's my experience with them. Um, uh, first of all, when we get into any kind of decayed wood, uh, it's much like a tooth in your mouth. You've got to get the decayed material out of there um, because any type of adhesive or even a paint will not stick well or adhere well to decayed wood. It just does not. Even if it did, you would usually the decay um, will extend at a microscopic level into the good wood. So you've really got to bore that out or clean the surface before you provide any kind of adhesive to it. Uh, that's number one, and you've got to be able to verify that. So that's number one. The second thing is for a lot of these, there's not been a lot of research published on uh, the effect repairs or various repairs have on residual capacity. Uh, most of it's been engineering judgment call. There's been some very good work done, but um, because of that, what I recommend is 
if the member's in compression, so if we have a column and we want to do compression on it, I'm fairly confident that um, uh, with repairs, because the, the, the joint or the compression is going to be in compression. Where I get very concerned is where we start to do those repairs in any kind of a tension mode. So bottom cord of trusses, a bottom cord of large timbers in bending, um, anything that has tension perpendicular to the fiber axis, I get a little concerned about. Um, so I know what the manufacturers recommend, and, but I'm very cautious about that just because there's been not that much published on it. Now, having said that, there are some good publications out there. If you run into that and you want information, contact one of us here at the lab and we can dig those out. We have not personally done a lot on, on use of epoxies in repair, um, but we sure know where to get the information for you. So I'm a, be very cautious is all I'm going to say because anything where we've got any kind of deterioration or water issues, um, usually any type of material, they don't bond well, and uh, that causes a problem. Second thing is with uh, wood structures, and especially ones in the, going to be exposed to exterior, applica exterior applications, um, a lot of these we design so that the wood can shrink and swell and move a little bit. Um, we're going to get differential shrinkage when we put large epoxy patches in there, and that if we get large moisture swings, we're going to get major stresses that build up between the epoxy fix and the wood. And that usually will result in some pretty severe shear stresses at that glue line, and you'll get some, some failures. So um, again, I'd be very cautious of it. There's not been a lot of work done looking at uh, the differential shrinkage of those things and how that affects residual capacity. So the net result to me is be very cautious of those. Other repairs that I've been involved with, like well, Ken there's a really good paper on this. Back in the 1990s, we did some work for the Defense Department. All of the most, excuse me, most of the minesweepers in the Gulf uh, are are over in the desert that we're using Desert Storm are wooden hulled and they're glued laminated oak, which is great, but they had some problems with the motor mounts. Bottom line is there was some splitting that went on. We recommended a field fix that just included uh, comprised of stitch bolts, pulling them back together, and they performed very well. No adhesive. It really didn't make any difference whether there was an adhesive or not. Now, that's a very specific application. Kept dry, even though they were underwater, the interior members were quite dry. Um, so we didn't have differential shrinkage patterns, and we didn't have that type of activity. But that worked very well. So um, that's about a lot of the things I get on the rehab area are what I'll call gross errors. Like I say, cutting out members, cutting cords out of trusses, uh, just uh, gross things. Mm. And those require engineering judgment calls on how to fix them. Right. And in some cases, there is no good fix. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it sure does. So let's let's wrap up then with a little more discussion about grading existing uh, lumber and timbers. Quite a few questions about that, and you know, not everyone in our audience is going to be a certified grader. So talk a little bit about what some of the options are there, and maybe kind of your experience with. Do you have to be able to see all four sides, or if you can see three sides, is that sufficient? And um, if yeah. if those questions are better suited to a, a certified grader, then we can we can just yeah. say that. That's a good thing. Well, first of all, um, there's a whole chapter devoted towards visual grading and coming up with allowables in a timber condition assessment manual. Get in. I just recommend anybody go into there and look at it because a lot goes into the visual grading. Bottom line is it would be best to have access to four sides, but not necessarily because if you got access to three, at least uh, I'm thinking now, buddy, on, on – uh, uh, light frame, you can get an indication whether there's or not they're split there. The bottom line on all of it is, though, if you run into problems and if there's a concern, there are several consultants in the U.S. that specialize in in-place grading uh, based on visual criteria. And 
I always defer those to those, uh, those kind of questions to those individuals so they can handle it. But the procedures they use are outlined in the condition assessment manual. Great. Great. Well, okay. Bob, that uh, that pretty much takes us to the top of the hour, and uh, you've uh, certainly done a great job for us today. I want to thank you for uh, your sharing your expertise with us. I'm going to ask Marcy if she would to come back and we'll let everybody know that the questions that we weren't able to get to uh, verbally here, we're going to be taking a look at those and have some of our help desk staff uh, try and get some answers to the rest of those questions. So, Marcy? Absolutely. Away.